Today's message is titled Victory in Jesus. And I just thought it was real fitting because when Jesus came into the triumphal entry and they laid down their clothing and the palm branches, it represented his triumph as king. Amen? Y'all still here, right? I promise I won't keep you too long, like Elizabeth Taylor told her first husband. <laughs> Some of y'all get that on the way home. 1 John 3, 1 through 8, if you'll, if you'll turn there with me. Uh, if I move too fast for you, good news, it should be up on the screen. It says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us. I love that word, lavished. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. He didn't just give us a little bit. He's la- he lavished it on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is they do not know him. Dear friends, we are children of God. Say that. Say, we are are. children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. We don't even know how good it's going to get. But it's going to get good. It says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered the heart of the man. What God has prepared for those who love him. And it goes on, and it says, everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as he's pure. Because we have the hope of eternal life, of Jesus coming to get his church, we purify ourselves. It motivates us to live pure and holy lives. I should have got an amen or somewhere around that point. It says, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues the sin has either seen him or has known him. Dear children, let not anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And I want you to key in on this last verse. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So why did Jesus come? He came to destroy the work of Satan, the enemy of our souls. I think sometimes in the church we don't take Satan seriously enough. We just kind of act like it's no big deal. And according to Barna Research, uh, most Christians don't even really believe he truly exists anymore. And let me tell you, he exists, he's real, he's wreaking havoc on the world, and he is trying to destroy you. His plan is for your destruction, his plan is for you to lose hope, his plan is for you to fall away, his plan is for you to mess up, his plan is to help you, help you think that God is not on your side, his plan is to get you to a place to where you are so discouraged and so defeated that you quit. And see, that's the problem. Today I see so many Christians walking around in defeat. Defeat is not for God's people. You wouldn't believe how many Christians have defeated thinking. They just wake up and their thoughts are already defeated. They've already made up their mind they're going to have a bad day. They've already made up their mind they're going to give in to that certain situation. They've already made up their mind that their kids are going to misbehave. They've already made up their mind that their boss is going to be in a grouchy mood. They've already made up their mind that their day is not going to go well. And they are defeated before their feet even hit the floor. Defeat is from the devil. Defeat is from the enemy. And Jesus came to destroy the devil's work. Some of us are defeated in our finances. We think, oh, I'm just never going to get ahead, and I'm just never going to. Some of you are defeated in your finances because you don't tithe. Amen? When you don't tithe, you will be defeated in your finances. Maybe some of your life has given you some setbacks. Stuff has just happened, and, and bad breaks are a part of life, aren't they? Sometimes things just don't work out. But don't give in to defeat simply because you're not seeing the fruit of your faith just yet. Do not be weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap a harvest if you don't give up, Galatians 6, 9. Some of us are defeated in our health. Can I tell you what medical science in America says is the number one reason why Americans are defeated in their health? It's what we put in our bodies. Some of us need to change our diets. Get out and actually exercise every now and then. Sweat. Amen? Some of us are defeated in our joy. I call them Eeyore Christians. 
they just wake up, well, it's going to be a bad day. And it's like, man, just put a smile on your face. Jesus lives inside of you. Greater is he who is in you than he who lives in the world. Get up, get dressed, act right, talk right, and just say, Satan, today is not your day. It's my day because I'm a child of God. So great has the love the Father has lavished on me that I shall be called his child. I am a child of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You back up, Satan, because my big brother's standing behind my back, and he's ready to take you out, and I feel a whole lot bigger. How many of you ever felt bigger when your big brother was behind you? I've got the King of kings and the Lord of lords backing me. I love what David said when he faced Goliath. You come to me with javelin and sword, but I come to you in the name of the Almighty. Man, if we could just grasp that. Jesus came to destroy the devil's work. Some of us were defeated in our love. We don't love nobody. We don't even love ourselves. Jesus can help you, folks. Some of us are defeated with our friendships. We just can't hang on to a friend. Every time we get somebody close, they move, something happens. And, and you know, the Bible says Jesus is a friend that's just closer than a brother. But I also believe the Bible says wherever two or three Stand agreeing. See, that, that means you've got to have at least two or three friends. God promised you that. I know I'm being a little loose with the interpretation there, but my goodness, how are you going to get two or three to agree on anything unless you're friends with them? God wants you to have people in your life that are significant, that you have relationships with, that you agree with. Don't accept defeat. But some of you, it's got to change as soon as you get up. You've got to start thinking differently. Let me read a few things the scripture says about God's people. In Romans 8, 28, starting with 8, 28, it says, and we know that God, that in all things, God works for the good. Everybody say the good. Of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. It doesn't say the bad. God causes all things, that means bad things, to work for the good. God causes everything to work according to the good if we love him. If you love Jesus, he's working on your behalf for your good. Who have been called according to his plan and purpose for, God, for those who God foreknew, he also predestined. How many people did God foreknew? Everybody. So that means he has a good plan for everybody. Not everybody walks in that good plan. This is for those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. So he already had it worked out. Way before the foundation of man, he had a plan worked out for you. And what is that plan? Number one, that you would be called, that you would be justified, amen, that you would be glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but giving him up for all of us, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Now, what are those all things? We're going to get to that in the end. I love this. It says, who will bring any charge against those who's got, whom God has chosen. Man, some, some, some of y'all Christians will accept any old charge. Satan tells you it's going to be a bad day and you just agree with him. You just accept his charge. You accept only the charge that God gives you. You accept only the report that God gives you. And what does that report include? We heard some of it earlier today. Exceedingly abundantly, above all we could ask or think. I, I don't know how big I can think. But however big I can think, God wants more than that for me. That's amazing to me. He is a God that lavishes his love on us. He is a God that graciously gives us all things. It says, Christ who died more than that, who was raised to life, and is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us. Boy, that's a mouthful. Not only did he die for our sins, he got up, and he's up in heaven at our defense. There's an accuser, and his name is Satan. He's got lots of names, but. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, summer? Or, I'm sorry, summer. Da um, danger, I guess I'm just longing for summer, what can I say? <laughs> danger or sword? <laughs> As it is written, for your sake, we face death all the day long. We are considered sheep to be slaughtered. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor present, nor future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. 
Let me read another one. It says in John 8, 34, 36, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. And see, what did the first text say? We are God's children. We're not slaves. And it goes on, so if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus set us free. John 10, 10 says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come life, or I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. You notice the kind of words God uses when it pertains to his promises to his children? Abundance, exceedingly, lavish, gracious. God is generous with his gifts toward his children. So the question is, why are so many Christians defeated? If these promises are true, why are so many of us defeated? And it's summed up in one word. And it's in our text. And it's called sin. Sin will keep you defeated. What is sin? God has a target. His word. It says that those who sin are lawbreakers. Amen? And when you're a lawbreaker, you're going against the Lord's plan for you. And you may say, well, we're no longer under the law, but we're under grace. Well, that's, that's even greater because Jesus took it even further. He said, yeah, you used to say don't commit adultery. Now I'm telling you don't even lust. I'll tell you what, the law is starting to sound a little better, isn't it? Because Jesus penetrates to the heart of the matter. And the heart of, of adultery is lust. You don't lust, you won't commit adultery. Jesus fixes the heart. He changes the heart. The problem is sin. And it says in our verse 4 of our text, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. And it goes on, it says, no one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Now, we know that everyone makes mistakes. Everyone sins, right? But it says no one who continues, keeps on, rejecting. No, I'm going to stay in this lifestyle. We are going to be defeated. And we're going to walk defeated. Satan is the author of sin. Amen? He was the first sinner in creation, and he passed on that sin through Adam to us because Adam allowed himself to be defeated. Adam had no reason to lose, yet he did. So if you're you're living a defeated life, it is because you are giving the enemy access through some sort of sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death in Romans 3.23. Or I'm sorry, Romans 6, 23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 3, 23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So the fact is, we've all blown it. We all have a sin problem. Jesus fixes it. Our text, again, says Jesus came to take away our sins in verse 5. He did what the law could not accomplish in that he sent the Holy Spirit to live inside of us to take away our sin. It doesn't just cover it anymore. See, back under the old covenant, the blood would just cover the sin, but the blood of Jesus takes away our sin. It sets us free from sin. We're no longer slaves to sin. We are now children of God. We are now sons and daughters. We are now overcomers. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. Don't you dare tell me you can't. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Pastor, I just can't. I can't get free. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can get free. Can I tell you the greatest sin I believe the church is committing today? It's addressed in Romans 14, 23. It says, whatever is not a faith is sin. Because you might say, you know what, I'm, I don't lie. I'm not committing adultery. I honor my mom and dad. I'm not fornicating. I'm married to the woman I'm sleeping with. And, and I'm, I'm doing all the right stuff. But the fact is, do you always obey what God says? Even when it doesn't make sense. Do you always listen to what he says? How does God speak? He speaks through his word and he speaks through his church. Amen? Apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. He speaks through his word, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and through his church. Because, see, here's the deal. The reason I believe this is the sin that most Christians commit is because There's only one way you would not do what God says. That's because you don't believe what he says is true. If you believe every promise in the book is mine, every jot, every tittle, every line, I put my faith in the word of God, the B-I-B-L, and I'll switch songs, I'm allowed to do that. 
If we believe these promises are true, what is our problem? Why is the enemy wrecking our country? Why are our churches only half filled? Why is the enemy seemingly having so much access to our lives? What's going on? Why are we always sick? Why are we always tired? Why are we always frustrated? Why are we always broke? Why are we always these different things that are signs of defeat? It's because we don't believe what God says. And folks, it's a sin. It's a word that Satan has tried to eliminate from pulpits. He's tried to nicify and castrate preachers into yes men. And this one refuses to submit. Because I am not unaware of his schemes. I know his plan. And I know it's for my destruction. And I will not follow it. I'm going to follow the plan of God. I don't care what it takes. I'm going to preach the truth. I'm going to say what the Lord tells me to say because I have faith that he's going to back me, even if it makes some of you mad. I love every one of you. And that's the reason I have to speak the truth. Lack of faith is sin. Now, Paul in this text is talking about eating. You know, there are some, there were some issues in Rome about eating different types of food and some of them didn't believe they could eat certain types of food and Paul was saying, if you can't eat it in faith, then don't do it. It's a sin. So what is faith? Man, the Bible's good. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. It says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Wow. That is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen is not made out of what is visible. So how do we know God made the universe? Because it exists. We see something And then there's something we can't see. We can't see the creator. But boy, we see evidence of his creation, don't we? Faith is just saying, you know what? I can't see it all, but I'm certain of it because God said it. It's not a blind leap either. Jesus has left his footprint. God has left his fingerprint all over this planet. If you want to see evidence that he's real, it's all over the place. Just look. Look at the order of the universe. Look at the, look at the force of gravity. Look at the distance of the sun. Look at how the moon keeps the tide under control. Look at all these things that somebody says happen by random chance. There is no way. And it goes on and it says, by faith we understand the universe was formed at God's command. And so what is, uh, what, what is seen was made by what is not visible. By faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of him and his offering. See, a lot of people say, well... Um, Cain was upset because, or, or God didn't accept Cain's sacrifice because it wasn't a blood sacrifice. There was no blood sacrifice yet. That system hadn't even been implemented until Abraham. It was because Cain came to him without faith. That was the sin. Whatever's not a faith is sin. Even the good things you try to do, if you don't do them in faith, do you realize that tithing in a lack of faith is sin? If you're just giving out of some begrudging obligation because you just know you're going to get asked to and there is no faith in your act, it's a sin. Whatever's not a faith is sin. Yes, you can go and say the pastor said sometimes tithing is a sin. Because it's the truth. Whatever you don't do in faith, it's a sin. And I'm telling you, I believe that sin is killing many Christians. It goes on and it says, By faith he was committed as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith he still speaks even though he is dead. By faith Enoch was taken from this life so he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away for, um, for before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleases God. And without faith, it is impossible, somebody say impossible, impossible, to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. It's not possible to please God without faith. No matter what you do, if there is not faith attached to it, it is sinful. Look in the Old Testament when the, when the Hebrews would bring their sacrifices and their offerings without faith. Um, Isaiah addressed it in the first chapter. What are these multitude of sacrifices to me? He said, I grow weary of your sacred assemblies. Your new moons and your Sabbaths, my soul hates. Why? Because they weren't offered in faith. They were living their own way. They were doing their own thing, and there was no faith attached to their ceremony. And see, as Christians, we want to throw ceremony out. Anything that's of tradition, just, it's, it's of the devil. Them Pharisees, they were just full of tradition. No, they, were, they had lack of faith. It wasn't their traditions that was the problem. Their faith wasn't in the right source. When your faith is in Jesus, 
Everything else lines up. Everything else works out. I know I'm reading a lot of verses today, but what did you come to hear? Me or the Lord? When you sin, listen to this. When you sin, you give the devil open right to attack you. Sin is a portal by which the devil steals your victory. If you are walking in it, you will not live victoriously. You will lose. Every promise in the book will not be yours. I'm not preaching legalism here. I'm preaching promise. Grace equals righteousness. Amen? I'm going to eventually get some help. When we become children of God, we become righteous. And Paul said, can bitter and sweet water dwell together? See, we can't say I'm a child of God and yet go live my own way and do my own thing and sin and claim grace. And can I tell you, when you sin, there is forgiveness. We're going to talk about that toward the end too. I thank God for forgiveness. But if we are constantly sinning and constantly seeking forgiveness, we may actually be forgiven, but we are not living in victory. We are living in defeat. So the question is, how can we live in victory? First of all, 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So number one key to victory is you got to know somebody's against you. There's so many people asleep at the wheel and don't even realize there's a real enemy out there trying to destroy them. And we just think, kumbaya, and the devil ain't attacking me. And the reason he ain't attacking you is because he thinks you're on his team. Amen? You can't hold, he uh, hold hands with the devil and claim to be his enemy. You can't have access to his devices and claim to be his opponent. You can't hold the devil's hand and then say, oh, Jesus, take my hand. I need thee every hour. you got to let go of one or the other. And I choose to cling to Jesus. And yes, sometimes I'm a mess. Yes, sometimes I mess up. And I thank God when I do, I have an advocate with the Father. But I am no longer holding hands with the enemy. I am freed from his devices, and I thank God for it. Amen? So how do we live in victory? Well, number one, we realize we have a real enemy. We have to live self-controlled and alert lives. We've got to pay attention and I love what this says. It says, your enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion. It doesn't say he is. He's a cheap copy. And it says he's seeking someone to devour. It means he ain't found anybody yet. Amen? The key to living victorious, are you ready, is Jesus. Boy, you wanted something complicated, didn't you? It's Jesus. That's it. Jesus is the cure for every problem that you have. I can give you no other solution than the name of Jesus. His death, his burial, his resurrection, his soon coming to collect the church, his seating at the right hand of the Father is everything I need to live victoriously. And if we will cling to him and hold on to him and give our lives to him, we won't be defeated. Yes, sometimes it's going to look like the enemy's got the upper hand. Sometimes it's going to seem like the enemy's having his way. But if I cling to Jesus... He is going to help me. He is an ever-present help in a time of trouble. Praise the Lord. So here we go. Heading toward the home stretch. The key to victorious living is Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 It says, Therefore, if anyone be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation the old things have gone, the new has come. So in Jesus, I am transformed. I am transformed from death unto life. I am transformed from wrath unto favor. All the old things are dead. The new things have come. So how do I live victorious in Jesus? Let him transform me. Submit to him and say, Lord, here I am. Change me, renew my mind, renew my heart. Do whatever you want to do in me, Lord. I am yours. That is the first step. Number two thing. 
to live victorious, we have to understand Jesus defeated sin. 1 Peter chapter 2, start with verse 21. It says, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. See, I'm not promising you a life without suffering. The scripture doesn't promise you that. But what I am promising you is a life where you can be the winner. There was some suffering last night, pretty close to 11 o'clock among the blue-clad nation. But in the end came the victory. Amen? That's how God works. I preached a message a couple years ago that I thought maybe God was a UK fan. You'll have to go back to YouTube to find that. Um, I'm praying that that never happens again because uh, I was a mess after that. Everybody was wanting pictures of me and everything. I was like, man, I ain't never been this famous before. Jesus defeated sin. To this you were called. Christ suffered for you to leave you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. Boy, that's key. Number one, Jesus didn't sin. And no deceit was found in his mouth. There was nothing in his life that merited him dying. When they hurled their insults to them, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He bore, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed for you're like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So Jesus committed no sin and defeated sin in us that we can live righteously. I'm going to read that again. It says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. See, the reason so many of us can't overcome sin is because we can't die. We want to be in control. We want to live our way. I always hate it when a preacher says salvation is a free gift. It's given freely. Don't get me wrong. You can't earn it, but it ain't free. Number one, it costs the Son of God his life, and it costs me mine as well. It costs my allegiance. It's just cost me taking up my cross. Jesus said, if anyone was going to come after me, let him first count the cost. He didn't say count the free. Amen? Count the cost and see if he's ready to pay up or not. It's freely given, but there is a great cost. Jesus defeated sin. So number one, submit yourself to Christ. Be transformed and recognize sin has been defeated. It's good news. Another thing we have to realize is death has been conquered. Not only did Jesus... See, see, I like the way UK beat West Virginia. Because they didn't leave no doubt. Right? They didn't leave no doubt. You, you, you whooped somebody by 39 points in the Sweet 16, and they, you, 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 you deserve the right to bark a little bit. Ooh. That's a big deal. And see, Jesus leaves no doubt. I just wonder if the devil says, sometimes, Jesus, you're going to be 36 and 1 by tomorrow. And Jesus just blows him out. Here's what I know. There is no failure in Christ. Why is there failure in us? It's because we're not fully submitted to Christ. Because if we're fully submitted to Christ, there's going to be no failure. I'm not saying that we're going to be perfect, but we are being perfected. We're going in the right direction. And when we're going in the right direction, that means we're winning. If I get some music. Jesus defeated death, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Start with verse 8. It says, Do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me as prisoner. It says, But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to live a holy life. Because of any, not of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. I want to skip down to the middle of verse 10. It says, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life. Did you hear that? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. In the middle of the verse, it says, Who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. How do we get saved? It is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. How do we get victory? It is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is through the death, burial, and resurrection 
of Jesus Christ. Jesus conquered death and brings us life. I love what it says in the latter part of verse 12. It says, I am not ashamed because I know in whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted into him until that day. I know in whom I believe and I believe he's able to guard that which he has entrusted until that day. I believe that I can walk in victory. I believe that Jesus' triumphal entry on Palm Sunday represents my freedom to live freely. Live freely from negative thinking. To live freely from defeat. To live free, freely in joy, in peace, in love. That I can have friends, that I can have fellowship, and that I can walk in victory. But see, here's the problem. Jesus paid it all, right? We love that song. Jesus paid it all. There's another part. All to him I owe. All to him I owe. See, there's work on our part. We cannot walk in victory by simply saying Jesus took care of it all. There's work that we have to do. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 18, it says, Finally, be strong. It doesn't say be weak. It says, Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on. The word put on means I got to do something. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Therefore, it says it again, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm. Then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the gospel. The radiance comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation which, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for the saints. See, folks, the only way to walk in victory is accept what Jesus did and then get off our butt and put on the armor. Amen? Do what he said to do. Now, I'm going to preach a whole series on the armor of God coming up in the next few weeks. So I'm just going to move right on through that because there's one more text I want to read to you. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse, starting with verse 3. It says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. I think at that point, God could have dropped the microphone and walked away. That's all we need to hear. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness, through these, He has given us these very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desire. We can be participants in God's nature when we put on the whole armor of God. When we make a stand and say, Satan, I am opposed to you, and I am on the side of Jesus. I'm going to hold his hand, and you better get away from me, because I'm going to walk in victory. I'm going to do what he's called me to do. I'm going to do what he's told me to say. I'm going I'm I'm to think what he's told me to think. I'm going to love. I'm going to walk in peace. I'm going to have joy. Thief, get out. Your intent is to steal, to kill, and destroy, but Jesus came to give me life. This is for this very reason. Make every effort. That means try, folks. Jesus did it so we can do it. That's why we got so many little children that are acting like crazies because parents do everything for them. Won't let them learn how to do anything on their own. They don't know how to behave because you never taught them. Jesus taught us. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, love. Listen, 
For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, in other words, if you're growing in Jesus, listen to this, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That sounds like somebody walking in victory to me. But if anyone does not have them, he's short-sighted and blind and has forgotten he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling election sure. For if you do these things, listen, you will never fall. You will receive a rich welcome in the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you have been defeated, it's because you've given the enemy access. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, do not give the devil a foothold. In that same chapter, it says, put off the old self and be made new in the attitude of your mind. Put on the new self. Put off falsehood. There's things we have to put off and there's things we have to put on if we want to walk in victory. He's basically saying, stop sinning. Really funny. In Ephesians chapter 4, when Paul says all this, it follows something else he said. He said, God gave us some to be apostles, pastors, teachers, evangelists. The reason some of you aren't walking in victory is because some of you don't listen to the advice you get from the leaders of the church. Amen? God, it says that he ascended and he gave gifts to men. And those gifts, it says, were apostles. Pat, I wish I had time to preach that. But can I tell you something? If you love Jesus, you're going to love his church. If you love his church, you're going to walk in victory. Because we're going to see to it. Because we're going to help each other. All right. Everybody stand up. We can just dial it down to the piano just for a minute. And listen to this. 1 John 2. So my dear children, all right, this so you don't sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice, the object that bears wrath till there's nothing left but favor. He took all of God's wrath upon himself for the whole world, for the sins of the whole world, not only ours, but the whole world. We know that we have come to him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. Truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. I love that verse. It says, if anyone has sinned, I pray that you don't. But if you do, you have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who is the propitiation or the atoning sacrifice, the object that bears wrath till there's nothing left but favor. Do you realize that any wrath you receive is due to your own lack of faith because it doesn't belong to you. Jesus paid it all. He truly did. See, here's the deal, folks. Some odd 2,000 years ago, 400 years of silence between God and man was broken. Israel had lived such a disobedient life that it said in Amos they would have a famine of the Word of God. And for 400 years, God was quiet, but He wasn't absent. He was still doing work. He was still preparing the plan of redemption for mankind. And that plan was found in the person of Jesus Christ who came through the Virgin Mary, who did not have the stain of original sin because His Father was not of, his earth, of this earth. His Father was in heaven. And he grew up, and he grew in wisdom, and he grew in favor, and he grew in stature. And then all of a sudden he became unpopular. Why? Because he preached a message that people could overcome without the law. If they would just come to him. And the Pharisees got all shook up, got all upset, got all frustrated. And they conspired with the Romans to have him killed. But what they didn't realize is they were playing right into God's hands. Because see, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Blood had to be spilled, and the blood of rams and goats wasn't cutting it. The blood of the perfect Son of God 
was spilled on that cross, dripped into the ground, ran into the water. And at that moment, the wrath of God was satisfied. Any wrath that you suffer is because of lack of faith. Because there is none left for you, saints. There's none left. It was all poured out on Jesus. There's none left. God's not mad at you, folks. He's not mad at you. But he's calling you to repentance. What was the message of Jesus when he walked us here? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And there are some of you this morning, you don't have victory in your life because you need to repent of sin. Because see, I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me And I heard about His groaning I heard about His groaning of His precious blood atoning and I repented of my sin and won the victory is there anyone this morning that says I need to repent I need victory in my life if you don't have victory it's because there's some sin and that sin may be lack of faith you may not be going out doing wrong things. You just don't believe what God says. Is there anybody in this place this morning that says, I need help. I need to walk in victory. I need to be set free completely.